I know what you guys are here for. Uh, everybody that follows this show understands that I am an Alabama fan. Um, have been my entire life, right? I went to my first game when I was eight months old. My father graduated from there. Both of my grandparents, uh, aunts, uncles, etc. We've been Alabama fans for a long time. Now, I've been through all of the bad years. I've, I went through all the Shula years. I went through the Mike Dubos stuff. I went through Bill Curry when I was really forming my fanhood. Uh, Gene Stylings, etc. Like, I've been through all of this. So, this was never a bandwagon thing. This was just something that I was born into. But I've tried my best to not be biased when it comes to uh, Alabama football. And when I look at what happened between LSU and Alabama last night, this is not what I wanted. Uh, <laughs> I, think of, I think of the situation where all, all dynasties eventually come to an end. And I am not saying that this is the end of the dynasty for Alabama. This team is still, uh, you know what? You know, we're going to restart this thing. We're going to restart this entire thing because we need to start off with the winners, right? LSU 32, Alabama 31. Let me write down that time. Da, 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 da. LSU 32, Alabama 31 in overtime. LSU goes for two in overtime after they score a touchdown on the first offensive play. The first play. They knock this thing out. It's beautiful, gorgeous, uh, incredibly run, and it was the same play that Brian Kelly ran when he was at Notre Dame back in 2014 against Florida State. Incredibly similar defensive scheme. He knew what would work against it, and he also said in the postgame press conference that he knew that, you know, even though that one was called for offensive pass interference, it was called uh, a pick play, he knew in Tiger Stadium that would not be called a pick play. And he, he was right. He was absolutely right. Now, it did not run the same way that the other one did, but it was effectively the same play. And it worked to perfection. You got Daniels throwing to a freshman tight end, and the lines held up. Everything was beautiful. It worked Perfectly. But that one play was not a referendum of the way that the entire night went. LSU was the better football team. Just a better coached football team. A tougher football team. Harold Perkins lived in the backfield for LSU. He absolutely caused havoc on Bryce Young. Bryce Young, less than 50% completion percentage. Just absolutely insane. Let's go on and pull up the, uh, the stats here and see exactly what we're looking at. Alabama ran 16 more plays. Uh, Alabama had 100 more total yards. Bama had more ter uh, more first downs. They had more yards per play. Granted, it was negligible, 5.74 to 5.64. Um, the issue for me was the yards per rushing attempt, right? LSU 5.4 to Alabama 4.6. LSU ran the ball four more times. Alabama had a higher yards per pass. Uh, but 25 out of 51 ain't getting it done. I mean, it's just nuts. Uh, you you see these numbers here, and LSU's success rate was much higher. Their standard down success rate was higher. Their passing down success rate was higher. Alabama had more tackles for loss and more sacks. Uh, Tyrone coming in. I'm kind of glad LSU won. Uh, yeah, I, I could understand it. Everybody wants a little bit of change, right? Like that's uh, you. That's why people watch Alabama is to see if they will lose because they are tired of Ohio State and Alabama and Georgia and Clemson and blah 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 blah. Right? It, you you hope for a changing of the guard, and I will tell you that by watching this game, I felt like this was a changing of the guard in the SEC West. This is Brian Kelly's first year, and I see that of course this is not loading the way that I wanted it to. Uh, there we go. All right, so. Uh, it is a changing of the guard. This LSU team is only going to get better. Like it, That's the crazy part about this. They are incredibly well coached. The defensive game plan from Matt House, the defensive coordinator. Of course, he came from the NFL, but he was at Kentucky for a very long time before that. Um, this was a masterpiece. He confused Bryce Young, and he used a lot of the same stuff that, that really messed with Bryce Young last season. Now, you're not going to be able to completely stop Bryce Young because he is absurd. I will tell you that. Uh, the way that last touchdown that he threw, 
where he was able to get loose in the pocket, and he there were four or five defenders that got their hands on him, and he broke free and was still able to see down the field to throw that touchdown pass to Ja'Cory Brooks. That's the kind of stuff that you cannot defend. It is impossible to defend that guy. It's, it's Johnny Manziel-esque, right? You can't stop that all the time. And to be fair, that is exactly what has kept Alabama in a lot of games this year. You saw it against Tennessee. Bryce Young worked magic in Knoxville. He worked magic last night in Baton Rouge. Absolutely did. And, uh, and sometimes it is not enough. It's just not. Madhouse brought pressure between the guards and made it where Bryce was uncomfortable. He couldn't get out of the pocket. He couldn't see where his uh, where his guys were making breaks, etc. Like he couldn't see it beforehand to see where they were. It was he was confused, absolutely confused. I will also say that I don't know that he is. I don't think he's one hundred percent healthy. Uh, he he didn't look right. I'll say that. Uh, and yet he was still able to make some really, really good throws. Uh, and that is not by any means an excuse for Bryce Young. I'm just saying that he didn't look right uh, from the very get-go. So, of course, we got to dive into, uh, one, LSU being absolutely incredible. Uh, they only have one loss in the SEC. Uh, they have to lose to both Arkansas and Texas A&M in order to not go to the SEC championship game. That is a remarkable, remarkable job by Brian Kelly. His first season, they have developed this much. They have worked their game plans to perfection. Now, granted, the Tennessee game did not go their way. Uh, that thing got off script immediately as soon as they dropped that opening kickoff. <laughs> right? I mean, it was just nuts. But what we need to look at from the LSU side is, are they going to be competitive in the SEC championship game? I don't think so. I think they will get there. I don't think Arkansas is good enough to stop them. I don't think Texas A&M is good enough to beat them either. So I think they're going to win out. Will they get to the CFP? I don't believe so. I don't think that this team is good enough yet to be able to compete with Georgia. And that's perfectly fine because it is year one of a rebuild. And yet they're making it to Atlanta. That is bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. And incredibly well done by that coaching staff. Mike Denbrock, a lot of people were not overly thrilled with the hire of the Cincinnati offensive coordinator because they didn't know exactly what he was going to be. Everybody thought, well, Miles Brennan might be the, the quarterback because he's the better thrower. Well, then, of course, Brennan decides to retire. Jalen Daniels comes in, and uh, Jaden Daniels, excuse me. There's so many Daniels, like JT and Jalen, and Jaylen, but regardless. So Jaden Daniels uh, develops over the season. He gets better. He's a better thrower now. He is a, a better uh, pocket presence. He is still a great athlete and a great runner as well. And he, the, the Denbrock offense has utilized every tool that Daniels has. They have found a way to get those receivers involved. Because remember, early in the year, they couldn't figure out how to get them involved in the game. They are now incredibly good blockers down the field. They are also still really good at catching the football. That is a fantastic wide receiver core. The running backs, uh, good gracious, I mean that the kid last night. Uh, let's look at the uh, the stats. Of course, we'll pull it up um, over at Stat Broadcast. The uh, let's see, Williams, Josh Williams, seven carries, fifty four yards, and they were man yards. They were man yards. Uh, it's toughness. This team is tough. They are really well coached. They are confident, and they are a tough team. Harold Perkins, Josh Williams. Uh, Look, John Emery, of course, with the touchdown catch, uh, just a, a, a fantastic night. A fantastic night for LSU. Now let's move it over to the Alabama side. Uh, you see Jameer Gibbs, 15 carries, 99 yards. His long was 34 here. Bryce Young, 25 out of 51, 328 yards, one touchdown. He did have the one interception on that opening drive where he threw it from about the four or five yard line and just threw it behind a guy. Uh, shouldn't have thrown it. Should have moved forward. But I mean, you had more downs. Like, what are you doing? Right? And that's the way that the game went basically the entire ball game, From that opening series for Alabama to the end of the night. That's what the, that's the kind of game it was. Uh, Jameer Gibbs led the team in receptions, 8 for 64. Uh, he had the most rushing attempts, of course, 15 for 99. Uh, Gibbs was the dude. 
Gibbs was the team. Field position early in this game is what set Alabama behind the marker. And a big part of that is the fact that even when they were backed up, they threw the football way, way more than you really should have. Gibbs was able to get some push, but they did not trust the offensive line, and they did not trust the running backs to be able to get them out of that spot. It's like they knew they had been stuffed so many times that they didn't trust their offensive line to be able to push their way out of being inside their own 10-yard line again. It was a carbon copy of what happened in the first half in Knoxville. LSU just, just, they don't have the firepower that Tennessee did, but they were able to win that field position game, and they went to the half with a 7-6 lead here. We, We can break down the game, but what this really comes down to at the end of the day and I will get off this game and get to the other games here in just a minute, but uh, we got to talk about Alabama for a minute. And I, I think the the biggest thing to take away from Alabama's loss to LSU is that this probably should have been uh, the fourth loss this year, uh, were it not for Bryce Young and his magical abilities to escape the pocket and, and find guys downfield, et cetera. Uh, no, the wide receiver core is not great. Right? It's not what Alabama has been used to over the last four years or so. But you did not have to have a fantastic wide receiver core in the past to be able to win at Alabama. The shift came when Scott Cochran left and went to Georgia. And Alabama fans will tell you that they believe that it was time for a change. And I think Nick Saban believed it was time for a change. I think Scott Cochran certainly believed it was time for a change. Because there were a lot of issues with injuries and whatever, and you're just trying to find... What is the issue? What we, we need to move forward as a program, and that's the biggest thing for Nick Saban is adapting as a football program. When they lost Cochran, they brought in uh, uh, Baloo and Dr. Matt Ray, if I'm not mistaken. I think, that, I think those are the right guys. Matt Ray is now with, I want to say the Saints. He's, he's somewhere in the NFL. And I, I think the biggest thing that left when Cochran left is the toughness of that football team. And you have seen it kind of dwindle, right? The the staff changes that they made as far as the strength and conditioning program worked beautifully for the 2020 football season. They did not work after that, right? Because in 2020, everything was already built. It, Cochran had already built those guys into monsters. The offensive line, the defensive line, the linebackers, everybody. The wide receivers were big and tough. And yeah, they were fast. And yeah, all that kind of stuff. But they were blocking machines. Uh, Alabama was an intimidating force as soon as they got off the bus. It is not the same now. This team cannot get a push on third and one when they need a yard. And it's never been like that under Nick Saban. Now, is it to do with Saban? Is it to, to do with the coordinators? You know, we can nitpick play calling all we want to, but at the end of the day, if your offensive coordinator does not trust your offensive line to be able to get a push on third and one, and I understand, yes, they had a, a third and one uh, goal line situation where they were able to run, but at the same time, they had to go up and Bryce did a bunch of different motions, et cetera. You ran across a tight end. You ran uh, uh, Jermaine Burton, I think it was, uh, across the across the backfield like you put him in a jet motion. You, you had all these different things that had to work in your favor to get guys out of the middle so that you could actually run up the middle. You didn't used to have to do that in Tuscaloosa. Like, there's something obviously going on with this that I, I don't know how you can fix it quickly, right? You can fix an offensive coordinator. You can fix a play caller. You can fix a defensive coordinator if you need to. I don't think Pete Golding is the problem. But regardless, uh, the issue at Alabama over the last two years has been the offensive line and the defensive line. And they're, they're not scary. There's nothing to the L- LSU was not terrified of them. Texas was not scared of them. Uh, there was you couldn't count on either of them to get a push when you needed it. Texas was able to run the football. Tennessee was able to run the football. LSU was able to run the football. I, at some point, you got to be able to stop the run. Otherwise, the other team can do whatever they want to. Yeah, we can talk about the secondary not being great in coverage or whatever, but the reason that Alabama's secondaries have always been pretty good is they've always been able to get pressure on the quarterback easily. If you can get pressure with three or four, then you've got plenty of guys in the backfield to be able to help out, right? And the quarterback has to be able to get rid of the ball quicker 
especially when you're bringing Will Anderson, et cetera. But Will Anderson and Dallas Turner and, and everyone else cannot do it by themselves. You have to be able to get pressure up front, up the middle. Because with them running the football the way that they did, the Williams kid was awesome. Daniels, all of his stuff that he was running to the edge and everywhere else, that's all stuff that could have been handled if you were able to get off your blocks. <laughs> it's just, it's so irritating. So irritating to watch. And regardless, uh, it was a big win for LSU, and it felt like a changing of the guard for Alabama. No, I don't believe that the Alabama dynasty is dead. But I will say last night that it looked like this, this could be a frustrating enough team to where it would not surprise me if Nick Saban were to retire at the end of the year. Just my thoughts on it. Uh, Double O'Neill said, uh, "Hurry up and bring on the thirteen or the twelve team playoff." Eh, I mean, do we really need a twelve team playoff? D- does Alabama and Clemson belong in a playoff? Really? And uh, yes, I understand that they have lost by one point in overtime to the number ten team on the road, and they lost to what was the number one team uh, on the last play of the game on a last second field goal on the road. I get that. But they, it is what it is. Justin Simpson says Bama just can't perform well away. Uh, they don't perform well at home either. They've just had an easier schedule at home. <laughs> this team, like LSU last year, the Ed Orgeron LSU team, held Alabama to one yard rushing last year or whatever it was. Like it, it that's insane. You, everybody saw that that defensive line for LSU last year. Everybody saw Alabama's offensive line all year. They weren't good. I guess just that's the way that this goes. Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. And make sure to leave a nice five-star review. You can follow Gary on Twitter, at GaryWCE. And the show is at Winning Cures. Be sure to check out the merch in our web store and share the show.